This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Definitely a tough day in the sporting world for today with the news that Mike Leach has passed away. Mike Leach, of course, one of the more fun personalities across all of sports, not just college football. But I remember I'd go home for Christmas and my stepdad would always like ask me, hey, do you know, did you hear this most recent quote from Mike Leach? I go back and I watched it on Twitter, or YouTube, whatever. And like every time it lived up to the hype, there was never like a an oversold moment from Mike Leach. It was always fun to, to you know, hear what he had to say almost regardless of what he was talking about uh and also like you think about sports the fun things are you want big personalities and you want at least for me fun offense and he brought both those things so a tough day uh definitely with mike leach passing away we'll talk more about that tomorrow on the show with uh dr ed fang get his thoughts on stuff uh his memories of mike leach but also we're going to preview uh the college football bowl season some more mike leach talk coming up then but just uh wanted to Open things up here by talking about that because uh, definitely a tough way to open the day for today. And uh, thoughts to everyone who was impacted by Mike Leach because I know that that is a a lot of people out there. But we'll talk more about that tomorrow on the show with Ed. Coming up on today here on Covering the Spread, going to take our first look at NFL Week Number 15 based on these spreads and money lines and totals over at FanDuel Sportsbook. I'll run through my power rankings haven't done that yet here on the show but i thought it might be a fun addition to the show kind of let you know where my numbers are at the top of the scales seeing who may be separating there and then we'll also recap last week here on the show and how things went just for transparency's pers- transparency perspective on all of that this is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel podcast network and numberfire.com my name is Jim Sonis I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire here like I said to break down what we're seeing across the NFL entering week 15 both from a power rankings perspective and a betting perspective we'll dive into all that in just one second but first a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts we of course are on Apple Podcasts. Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, wherever you listen, you can find us. And if you like what you hear, drop us a rating and review as well, because that does help us out a bunch. Looking to get more out of this NFL season? Well, now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's free bets back. If your first bet doesn't win, just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It is safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on anything from the money line to touchdown scores to over under yards. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in free bets when you join FanDuel. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Must be 21 plus and president select states. First online real money wager only. Refund issued is not withdrawable free bets that expire 14 days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG. In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Kansas, ksgamblinghelp.com or 1-800-522-4700. Also, the number in Wyoming there. In Louisiana, 1-877-770-STOP. In Maryland, mdgamblinghelp.org. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text hope and Y. Or in West Virginia, go to 1-800-GAMBLER.net. So let's dig into my power rankings here. Enter week number 15. As I mentioned, I thought it might be a good addition to the show. Just kind of give you a reset of where my numbers are at the top of the pool or some teams I think may be on the ascent, maybe a bit underrated, overrated stuff like that entering the week. Now, these numbers reflect injuries I expect to impact week 15 specifically. So, for example, Debo Samuel is not done for the year but he's not going to play for week 15. So I, this is taking him out stuff like that. So this is just for week 15, but broadly applicable uh, for some other stuff as well. So Baltimore might be lower than you expect because I'm expecting Lamar to sit again, uh, stuff like that. San Francisco, the same thing. The one thing that my two betting models agree upon is that the Eagles are second, regardless of the model They're The team in first is not the same. We'll talk about it in a second, but the Eagles are second, regardless of the model. They're efficient in every aspect and offense the defense has been able to overcome 
It's deficiencies in recent weeks, getting Jordan Davis back, signing and Dominican Sue, Linval Joseph, stuff like that. I think that they're, they are aware of their deficiencies and accounting for them. And I find that super encouraging in terms of trying to figure out a team's longevity. Can you adjust after teams adjust to you? And it seems like the Eagles can. It's not a hot take, obviously, to rank the Eagles second. Uh, but I think that it is noteworthy because they have played a soft schedule. People are aware of that. But I do think it's noteworthy that they do grade out well, even after you adjust for the teams they faced. The key difference across the two models is a team in first for each one. In my traditional model, which is back testing better right now compared to the newer model, the Chiefs are first and the other model, it's the Bills. I think the reasoning for this split is that the newer model is expecting regression for the Chiefs on late downs. They are an outlier in how good they've been in terms of late down success rates, especially when you look at like third and long, they're bananas. I don't know if that's sustainable. It might be because it's Patrick Mahomes, it's Andy Reid, it's Travis Kelsey. It, it might be sustainable, but I don't want to like assume that it is that they're a true outlier there. And that's why they're lower in that model than they are in my more traditional model. It's also penalizing them a lot for their defense, which is, I think, a legitimate liability. Letting up 28 points to Russell Wilson, Brett Rippon on Sunday did not look good. So I lean more toward my new models ranking for the Chiefs specifically because the defense stinks. They've lost key head-to-head -head matchups with the Bills and Bengals. That's not factored in. Like, win-loss record is not in there. But I wouldn't be shocked if they are the best team when all is said and done. I just don't think I'd put them there right now because of defense, because of stuff like that, and potential regression on late downs. In the traditional model, the rest of the top five after the Chiefs and Eagles is the Cowboys, Bengals, and Bills. I think that all makes a lot of sense. After that, we get a bit of a surprise because, again, this is just for week six or week uh, week 15. So knocking down teams like the Ravens, the 49ers, uh, the Lions are next up. I think that's too high. Uh, which is why I'm like wincing as I say it. I think they're too high in this model, but this model gives a ton of weight to passing efficiency and the Lions have been among the most efficient passing offenses in footballs this year, especially once you account for injuries, you know, account for not even DJ Chark, not having a Monroe St. Brown for a couple of games. Josh Reynolds is out. They missed a lot of guys and those guys are now healthy. So this is interesting to me. I think it's too high. They're 11th in my other models, so there is a pretty big gap, but it's also, it's the same tier. Um, I think they're a legitimately good football team. You know, even again, if my more pessimistic model has them ranked 11th, that's still pretty high, and that's like a legit playoff team. So I think they're an actually good football team, and we'll talk about the implications of that as we talk about Week 15 later on. If we focus on the new model, top five there is Bills 1, Eagles 2, Bengals 3, Cowboys, and then the Chiefs. So it's the same top five for both models, just in different orders, effectively with the Chiefs and the Bills kind of being flipped. And I can live with that. But I do think it's worth noting the Cowboys and Bengals belong firmly in that top tier. I have no reservations about making them either of those teams a top five team. Both these teams have been good despite a lot of changes throughout this year. They made adjustments, um, you know, more so the Bengals, they made adjustments and the Cowboys. But I think that the big takeaway for me from looking at these numbers is there is a tier of five at the top. After you downgrade the 49ers for their injuries, that tier being Bengals, Cowboys, Eagles, Chiefs, Bills, not in that order. But I think that those top five are the prohibitive favorites uh, to take this thing down. Again, no Lamar in there, no Debo, stuff like that. But um, I think that I feel very firm putting those top five in a tier of their own. The final ranking I wanted to highlight here was the Jags. Uh, they're eighth in one model and 12th in the other. They're similar to the Lions where they're higher in the one model because it juices up passing efficiency a lot. And they're very good there. Trevor Lawrence is playing good football. So they might be able to rate in the one model, but I like them a lot. I considered taking their money line against the Cowboys for this week. I haven't gotten there yet uh, because, again, my numbers do love Dallas, but I don't think we should sleep on them. Maybe I should take the, the Jags money line, given the defensive injuries the Cowboys have and stuff like that, and now Terrence Steele being out. Maybe I should go Jags there, but I don't know. Maybe I'll just uh, maybe I'll try to find a way to bet the over in that game. My numbers aren't showing value there, but uh, just for funsies to get something there, I'll stack in DFS, whatever it may be. But the Jags and Lions, both teams think are very noteworthy in terms of where they rank my power rankings, but tier five at the top, Bills, Chiefs, 
Eagles, Bengals, Cowboys, and I feel very good about those five teams specifically. Now, let's take those rankings and spin them forward to talk about week number 15, because right now, there are five bets I want to lock in for week number 15, and two of them are actually in the same game. That's on Saturday uh, for the Vikings-Colts game. I want the Vikings minus four and the under at 48 and a half, both which are available right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. My numbers have told me to bet against Minnesota in four of their past six games. And it worked perfectly last week. So if you remember last year, if you were listening to covering the spread, my numbers were high in the Vikings at all times, talked about their win total over this offseason. It became a kind of a running joke that my numbers are too high in the Vikings. That has very much not been the case this year, especially the past two months or so. So this is not a Jim's numbers are still too high in the Vikings thing. But my numbers for this week have the Vikings favored over the Colts by 6.37 and 6.26 points, uh, depending on the model. So both models agree there is value here. I'm expecting Christian Darrisaw to be back for this game. He is their left tackle. He cleared concussion protocol prior to week 14, but they held him out because he had two concussions in pretty rapid succession. But with his clearing protocol, um, I feel like they get Darrisaw back. Harrison Smith probably back here as well. The Colts offense, I think they suck. Um I don't think they'll be able to run the football here. I think the Vikings rush defense is pretty good. Uh, the rushing offense numbers, despite the name value of like Jonathan Taylor and some of the guys along the offensive line still, it hasn't been good. And Matt Ryan, potentially in a negative script, that could get kind of gross. And that's why I'm laying the minus four. As far as the total, it's a lot of the stuff. You know, I don't think the, Cal- the, the Colts will be able to move the ball super well. Skeptical of Matt Ryan. The Vikings on offense, not the most explosive team. So it is tougher to cover a four point spread when I also want the under at 48 and a half. You know, you typically want to go reverse of that. But I do think both sides are the correct way to read this one. So I'll take the Vikings minus four and the under of 48 and a half in that same game. My um, numbers also do like another favorite this week, and that's the Eagles minus eight and a half against the Bears. I mentioned the Eagles are second in both my models right now. The Bears are 29th or lower in both. And a lot of that's because of the defense. The defense wasn't good and then got really, really hurt. So it may feel odd to have them so low with Justin Fields playing very good football right now. But the passing offense is still not very good. And when you're talking about covering eight and a half, you know, one of the fears you have is a backdoor cover. But if they're not going to throw the ball efficiently, which I don't think they will with Darnell Mooney being out, which is kind of bad talent, a pass catcher, it's tougher to see a backdoor cover happening. And this defense is banged up, which may not be as true coming off their bye, but I just don't think the Bears are a good football team. Um, That's a good thing for them. They should be bad because it gets them a better draft pick. That is a positive thing for them. And Fields has played good enough to give them hope. So I think that's encouraging too, but I think the Eagles are just a very good football team. And I think they're better than the eight and a half implies. Eight and a half is a key number in terms of if you're looking for teasers. I'm not a big teaser person because typically it requires me to have uh, both two situations I like and to get across the important key numbers. This one does fit that. And I'd be receptive to putting this in a teaser. I just couldn't find a good dance partner for it. So I'll take it straight up uh, at the eight and a half. If you have another game you like and are looking for a teaser, I think this is a great one. I just couldn't find a second one myself. Uh, So Eagles minus eight and a half is the way I'd play this one. But again, it is in play for that. If you uh, find another team that you want to tease for this week. The other two bets I like for this week are both Moneyline underdogs. Those are the Seahawks against the 49ers and the Giants against the Commanders. Seattle is a plus 154 at FanDuel. You might be able to get 158 at uh, some other spots, so shop around on this one. And most of this is because the 49ers injuries make this a volatile offense to project right now because it's the first time we've seen a full game of Brock Purdy with no Debo because when Debo got hurt, against the Buccaneers, they were already up big in that game. And Purdy, I think, threw like three pass attempts in the second half. Now, Purdy has an oblique injury, um, and there's no Debo. That should eventually add up. Now, it is frightening to bet the Seattle money line, given that you think about the way Seattle got manhandled by the Panthers. Despite stacking the box in that game, you know Christian McCaffrey is going to be able to go bananas in this game. So that's tough. That's tough mentally to get over. But I think Seattle's offense can somehow keep pace here. So you've got a lot of volatility on the 49ers, which means that getting plus 154 in a money line is pretty intriguing. Uh, under 40% implied win odds for the for the Seahawks there. 
So yeah, they could get smoked. They might not get a stop at all defensively, but that's all baked into this number. So I am going to take the Seahawks at plus 154 to win this game against the 49ers, despite the fact it is frightening to envision this 49ers rushing offense against uh, the Seahawks rush defense. As mentioned, the other one is the Giants at plus 176 against the Commanders. The Commanders are coming off a bye. They're at home. It is a repeat matchup. And in that first one, I took the Giants money line. I should have taken the spread because the money line wound up pushing. But I still like them here. I'm less bullish on this one than the Seahawks one because I'm not sure if Leonard Williams will play. Uh, Williams missed last week. I believe he was ruled doubtful, which implies that he has a chance to suit up this week because he was not ruled out officially. But they also could be without Richie James and Daniel Bellinger. The Giants, though, aren't laying down. I know that they didn't play well against the Eagles, but as mentioned, the Eagles are a very, very good football team. I don't think Taylor Heineke is equivalent to Jalen Hurts. So volatility can be our friend. Taylor Heineke can be a volatile quarterback because he kind of plays like he thinks he's Patrick Mahomes sometimes. He's not quite, you know, there athletically or from an arm talent perspective. So volatility can be a good thing. And I think this is one of the spots where it does help us. So I will be willing to take the Giants at plus 176, despite concerns or an injury specifically to Leonard Williams, but also to a lesser extent, Richie James and Daniel Bellinger. One bet I'm not making this week, despite showing value as the Dolphins at plus seven and a half against the Bills. I'm just really worried about Tua. I talk a lot on the show about negative highlight bias and how it can play into the way we bet. You know, we overemphasize the bad plays and may underrate a team as a result. But like the bad plays have been real bad. It, I like it kind of seems a little yipsy, like got the yips potentially. I don't know. I don't know what, what's going on, but it looks real bad to look better in the second half against the Chargers. And I thought that was good, but it was still not encouraging. This game is currently projected to have wind speeds around 15 miles per hour. I don't care about the snow, but 15 mile per hour winds. We've seen the Bills play in that. We haven't seen the Dolphins do so super successfully very often. Jeff Wilson's banged up, which means they might not be as able to overcome the elements in this game as they would if, if Wilson and Moser are both healthy. I don't think the Bills are well suited for this weather either. We saw them playing in a game with a little bit of wind and some precipitation on Sunday against the Jets and the Jets barely covered, but like I thought played decently, especially on defense there, but that's also the Jets defense. Jets defense is a lot better than the Dolphins. So it's possible I'm overselling how big of a deal all this is. The two of yip stuff combined with the wind, but it's still rough. Um, I gave it thought. I think there's a chance that maybe I'm overselling the concerns here, but you know, if you want to, if you're not as concerned, I would take the points at plus seven and a half. But as of right now, I'd rather make no bet than make one that I regret. So for me, I'm just going to wind up staying away most likely and uh, ignoring a spot where my numbers are joint value. The final one I want to discuss was that uh, the lions, because again, they're very different. My two power rankings and the same thing applies to New York jets. Just so happens, both those teams are playing in week number thir- uh, week number 15. If I look at my traditional model, again, this one has performed better. I'm kind of running them both in tandem and seeing which one back tests better to see which one I want to go with for next year. As of right now, the Lions in the traditional model, uh, it says they should be favored by three points in this game, despite it being in New Jersey. So it has the Lions as three-point favorites here. The other one has the Jets as three-point favorites. A six-point difference between the two two models is nuts and kind of concerning, I guess. But the Lions, again, super high in one, a little bit lower in another. The Jets super high in the, the newer model because it loves their defense. Their early down efficiency is actually okay in terms of what they've done there. So I understand why we get to both situations where one model likes the Lions, one model likes the Jets. I didn't think there'd be a six point gap between the two because that is massive, but I'm just going to stay away. You know, if there is this much uncertainty, I like both these teams. I kind of don't want to root against either of them. So the way I get out of it is that with the models disagreeing, it's like, okay, I don't have a great read on this. I can just let it be. And I'd again, I'd rather make no bet than one that I regret. So I'm going to let that one slide and see how it plays out. But loving what Jared Goff is doing. Love this Jets defense. So I'm excited for that game. I'm just not going to be wound up. I'm not going to wind up betting it uh, unless the markets go really, really wild over the next couple of days. 
So to recap, the things I actually am betting for this week, I like the Eagles minus eight and a half against the Bears. I like the Vikings minus four against the Colts and the under in that game at 48 and a half. And then I like the Giants money line against the Commanders at plus 176 and the Seahawks money line at plus 154 uh, as my bets for this week. Hopefully week 15 goes as well as week 14 did. Speaking of which, let's dive in now to our recap of this past week. We'll start things off with some World Cup. We talked with World Cup with Dr. Ed Fang. We had three bets uh, that we talked about last week on the show with Ed. Those wound up going one and two. The losses were France, England under two and a half goals and France, England to have an even number of goals. Those were minus 126 and minus 110 respectively. The winner, uh, the winning bet for Ed was a thriller, which was Netherlands and Argentina to have an even number of goals. It was two nothing late, so tracking to be a good bet there. But the Netherlands scored to make it two to one, which meant that, you know, no longer even number. But then they hit the equalizer in stoppage time to make it an even number. I was on a plane, so I didn't get to actually watch this game, but uh, reading about it after the fact was pretty fun. Uh, that was minus 115, so fun way to win a bet for Ed. Um, you know, one and two overall, but fun to get the win in that fashion. We're going to talk more World Cup of that on Friday, so we're not going to get thoughts on the semifinals uh, before that comes up, but we're going to talk about that on Friday to talk about uh, the, the finals of the World Cup, get his read on that, and uh, we'll also have Ed on Wednesday to do a bowl preview. So if you're doing like a college football bowl pool with your office or with your family and stuff like that, we'll go through some strategies for that because that is a genius when it comes to that stuff. We'll talk about that, talk about some specific games he likes, uh, games he might like more than others, um, but should be a good one talking to Ed there. We had JJ Zacharyson on to talk player props. Uh, he split the yardage bets. Check out JJ on Twitter at late round QB and check him out at late round.com. He had Nick Chubb over seven and a half receiving yards. Chubb finished with three receptions for 20 yards. That one hit pretty easily. Other one was Daniel Bellinger over 19 and a half receiving yards. Bellinger caught his third pass to get to 19 receiving yards, but he left with the rib injury. He, had he had a 61% snap rate here. He's typically around 90 when he's healthy. So probably would have gotten there if not for the injury. Tough way to lose that one with Bellinger. Uh, the touchdown bet for JJ was Isaiah McKenzie, a plus 290. McKenzie did have five targets and a rush attempt, but no touchdowns there. But a split on the yardage props and a tough loss in the Bellinger one. Probably would have had it if not for the injury, but a tough break for JJ there. Finally, we had Ryan Williams on to talk uh, both week 14 and Monday night football. The Sunday bets for Ryan went four and three hits were the chargers plus three and a half. They won that game outright. The lions Vikings over 52 and a half, the Bengals minus six and a half, despite some wild movement on Sunday in that game. I think it closed like three and a half, uh, despite being six and a half. So no CLV, but an, a pretty emphatic win for Ryan. Despite that, uh, that was also even money. Uh, at six and a half. And then he had the Jags plus three and a half and they won outright. So uh, pretty uh, fun couple of wins there for Ryan there. Uh, the losses were the Bills minus nine and a half. They won by eight. The Bucks plus three and a half. And then the Dolphins charged over 51 and a half. So a profit week for Ryan on Sunday. Monday night, Ryan liked the Cardinals Patriots over 43 and a half. It's tough to know how much the Kyler Murray injury influenced the way this game played out because... Cardinals offense didn't do a whole lot, but also gave up some special team scores. It finished with 40 points at the under hit there, uh, but hard to know how much Kyler's injury from Andre Stevenson, Devontae Parker, all that stuff played into that game going under. We didn't hit on the anytime touchdown calls. Uh, those were um, Kyler Murray at plus 290, Hunter Henry at plus 330. And then Ryan also mentioned Mac Jones over one and a half passing touchdowns at plus 142. The yardage slash other props, though, what did go well for Ryan, three and one on those. He had Hunter Henry over 30 and a half receiving yards. He had 70 in that game. Ryan also had James Conner over 18 and a half receiving yards. He had 29 and he had DeAndre Hopkins with over six and a half receptions at plus 106. He finished with seven. So actually three and oh on those. Uh, I counted the Mac Jones one under there, but three and oh on the uh, the yardage slash reception props. Oh, and three on the touchdown bets. But I think a solid read from Ryan overall. Hard to know how the the Kyler injury would have influenced things if Kyler would have gotten that touchdown. He was running, which I thought was good, uh, as we discussed in the show. But I think a good read from Ryan, a good week overall for Ryan once again. I had, I think, my best week of the year so far. I hit on four of the five bets we discussed here on the podcast on Tuesday. That did include the Jags money line at plus 166. It wound up closing at plus 150 once it became clear that Trevor Lawrence was good to go. And... He was not good to go. He was great to go. He played awesome in that game. 
Um, so Lawrence quickly becoming one of my favorite quarterbacks. I know that like part of that's because I've profited off of uh, his playing well and that uh, the Ravens game had the money line and then this one as well, but he's just, he's a good quarterback and it's fun to watch good college quarterbacks translate into good NFL quarterbacks. I think we're seeing that with Lawrence and it's, it's been fun to watch. So I like Lawrence a lot of, and I like that, that Jags team. They're pretty fun as well. I also had the total in that game. Uh, we talked about that Tuesday. It was 42 and a half. And I said that I wanted to wait and I would take it once it got to 41 and a half, which it did do during the day Tuesday. So probably by the time you listen to it, it was down to 41 and a half. It actually got down to 40 and a half. So I did not get the best number, which is frustrating, but the Jags scored 36 by themselves and there were 58 total points in that game. So didn't get CLV on that one, but I felt good about my read on that and uh, felt good about the results as well. Uh, with that one going well over 41 and a half. Other two wins were the Lions at minus one and a half and the Jets at plus nine and a half. The Jets one might have been a bit lucky because it was aided by a safety, but they lost that game by eight. I'll take it. Uh, they could have potentially had some other stuff work in their favor had it not been for the safety. So I think they still might have covered, even, even if not for the safety. But uh, I'll take it either way. It's a win. Win's a win for sure. The Lions kick butt. Um, they... Played really well the entire game. It got to two and a half pretty quickly after we talked, but then went back to one and a half. Uh, really fun market to track the entire week, honestly, with that Lions. Kind of hoping we see something chaotic uh, with this Jets game, too. So maybe I can get some action there, but not expecting to, but I wouldn't be mad uh, if it were to get a little bit wonky there. Um, but the Lions just played great. So felt good about that one the entire way. The loss to me last week was the, the Seahawks at minus three and a half. They got a big hole early. They couldn't claw their way back. A bit concerning that my numbers are on Seattle once again. I've been betting against the 49ers a lot. Not last week, but overall, I've been betting against them a lot. So it's a convergence of a team my numbers have liked and one they've been more skeptical of than the market. So we'll see how things play out. But I do still feel good about the Seahawks uh, money line for this week, despite the loss in them last week. As for last night, the two props I mentioned were Ramondre Stevenson under 75 and a half rushing yards and Nelson Aguilar over 29 and a half receiving yards. Now, for transparency's sake, I did not bet these because I was in Florida, so I could uh, unless I, I think they have casino betting, but I couldn't do mobile, so I didn't. Uh, so these were more soft recommendations than Full recommendation. Stevenson got hurt. Uh, not fun to win that way. Uh, I finished, I think, like 10 yards. So it's a win. I don't feel great about it because I like Ramondre Stevenson. Don't want him to get hurt, but did catch there. Uh, Aguilar finished with 32 yards on 10 targets. It took him 10 targets to get to the over on that number, which, again, also doesn't feel great. And also a Devontae Parker injury. But, hey, you know, um, I wish I'd gotten been able to bet those, but a four and one week overall in the full recommendations with one of the wins being a plus 166 money line. That's a nice week. And I'll take that for sure. Uh, it's nice confirmation that as we talked about a lot throughout this, this year, my results have not been good, but the numbers are back testing. Well, if I would bet everything, I'd have positive, positive ROI, both in money lines and spreads. I haven't been doing that and haven't been profitable, but it's nice confirmation that that, back testing well can translate to good results going forward and i i can take a lot of uh solace in that just have to keep picking well and build on a solid week 14 hopefully run it back once again in week 15 we'll talk more about week 15 in the nfl on thursday by talking to ryan williams and we'll also talk some player props with jj zacharyson on friday as mentioned the rest of the roadmap for this week we got ed fang on tomorrow talks and bowls we'll talk again like i said some mike leach there as well talk about bowl pools and get you set for those ed back with us friday as well talk about the world cup final and get his read on that one, in addition to JJ on Friday as well. That is all that we have here for today, though, on Covering the Spread. As mentioned, please make sure you are subscribed wherever you get your podcast because numbers move. We want you to get these numbers as quickly as possible uh, before they move against, uh, move in our favor and stuff like that. So if you want to get the best numbers, make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread to get notified as these podcasts go live each and every day on your podcast platform of choice, but also over on the FanDuel YouTube page. If you've got any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. I want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across the next couple of days. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to break down some college football bowl pools. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 